Fishing is much more than fish. It is the occasion when we may return to the fine simplicity of our forefathers. The Mediterranean Sea, for some people, is a way of life, the only life they know. Morning comes early for the small fishing village of Marsa Schlock, situated in Malta. Year after year, these Maltese fishermen brave the sea in these boats. Their aim is to bring back one of the sea's most sought catch, the dolphin fish, known locally as the Lampuka. Behind each catch, there is a story. A story that the average consumer rarely, if ever, has the opportunity to fully experience and appreciate. The Maltese fishermen are well known for their relationship with this creature, the Lampuca, the dolphin of sailors, or Corifina hipporus. In order to truly understand this story in its entirety, we must look at the sea, where it all begins, and see it for ourselves from the fisherman's perspective, whose courage and sacrifice makes all this possible. This is the story of the Maltese fishermen who go out in the open sea to catch the Lampuka. Marsa Schlock is a beautiful, picturesque village overlooking the sea, situated at the extreme southeast of Malta, a position which has always furnished its fishing and cultural link with the Maltese islands. It consists of an area of 4.7 square kilometers and a population of around 3,500 inhabitants. But behind such eye-catching scenery, there is a story to tell. It is the story of the Maltese fishermen, as told by them, their life, their hardship, and their outlook for the future. The word Marsashlok is related to the name for the dry Sirocco wind that blows from the Sahara, comparable to the equivalent Catalan word Shalok. It was in the Golfo dello Sirocco which means Schlock's Bay, that the first Venetians landed and set up trading posts in Malta during the 9th century before Christ. During the Great Siege of Malta, Marsa Schlock Harbour was also used as an anchorage by the Ottoman fleet. Derived from the word Marsa, which means a place fit for anchorage or a harbour, this quiet little fishing village becomes quite busy on a market day. Home to about 70% of the Maltese fishing fleet, the harbour is like a bowl of beautifully wrapped candy with scores of vibrantly painted boats in hues of yellow, red, blue, green and brown all nestled side by side. The bows of many boats are painted with the symbol of the eyes of Osiris and are said to protect the fishermen while at sea. This practice is believed to have been inherited from a civilization that once called the island of Malta home, the Phoenicians a Mediterranean trading culture dominant between 1550 till 300 years before Christ. The water is strung with boat upon boat, bow to stern across the crowded bay, with fishermen working side by side. One can observe many vendors, particularly those selling different kinds of fish to tourists and Maltese who come to this quaint little village from different parts of the island. The kind of fish sold depends upon the fishing season concerned. 
Life on board a Maltese fishing vessel is hard. One successful expedition can render quite well on the market. With a mixture of some luck and sheer persistence, the Maltese fishermen can make a living, but there are no guarantees, as they must venture further out to sea and take on the competition. Kanitsanti fishing is a story of the lives of many men and women at Marsa Schlok. Today, around 1% of the Maltese population makes its living directly or indirectly from the activity generated by fishing. One of the fishing seasons most eagerly awaited by these fishermen is the Lampuki season, where Kanitsanti fishing takes place. The beginnings of the traditional Maltese method of capturing lampuki by the use of a kanitsata are blurred. However, it is thought to date back to Roman times. Curiously, the fishing technique has been recognized recently for its efficiency and adopted by other Mediterranean fishermen, such as in Sicily, Tunisia and Spain. Traditional fishing such as Kanitsanti fishing is an example of how civil society is able to survive spontaneously and cooperatively despite difficulties. Kanitsanti fishing is a speciality of the Maltese Islands and deserves particular attention both on account of its economic importance and its ingenuity. This season lasts from mid-August till the end of December. It is the only time of the year when Kanitsati fishing is practiced. This is in accordance with Article 12 of EU Regulation 1343 of the European Parliament and of the Council of 13th December 2011. During this season, Lampuki or dolphin fish, or as also widely called Dorado or Mahi Mahi and Fumfrey, pilotfish or Naucratis ductor are caught in quite large quantities. The Lampuka is usually found in shoals together with the pilotfish. Mahi Mahi means very strong in Hawaiian and is commonly used elsewhere. In the Pacific and along the English-speaking coast of South Africa, they are also commonly called by the Spanish name Dorado. The dolphin fish is known in 37 native languages. The Lampuka is a deep-sea fish of the tropical and subtropical zones. The dolphin fish occurs in the Atlantic, Indian and Pacific Oceans in tropical to warm temperate waters. It is abundant in the Gulf of Mexico, the Florida current and throughout the Caribbean. In the eastern Atlantic Ocean, dolphin fish are found between the Bay of Biscay in France and the mouth of the Congo and as far south as the southern tip of Africa. Populations in the eastern Pacific Ocean range from the coast of Oregon and California south to the Galapagos Islands and Peru. It might move far away from the coast in search of food. The Lampuka is widespread throughout the Mediterranean, including Iberian waters, Maltese waters and the southern Tyrrhenian Sea. However, it is not found in the Adriatic, Marmara or Black Seas. According to the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, the dolphin fish is a highly migratory species and has been registered in 144 countries. The dolphin fish vis-à-vis -vis the aquaculture sector may be considered as an ideal one if one had to fish farm this creature. This is due to a number of advantages. It grows quickly. It has gained considerable popularity amongst the Maltese and is gaining fast in popularity elsewhere. Unfortunately, 
we are faced with a number of limitations as the fish does not live in waters below 17 degrees centigrade. This is the case of water temperatures around the Maltese Islands during the winter period. Great efforts are being registered in Miami, Florida, in the United States and in Australia, so that fish farming, the dolphin fish, is developed further and sustained. The common English name of dolphin causes much confusion. Additionally, two species of dolphin fish exist. The common dolphin fish, that is the Corifina hipporus, and the Pompano dolphin fish, or Corifina equiselis. The dolphin fish can be distinguished from the Pompano dolphin fish by its body depth. Body depth of the dolphin fish is less than 25% of its standard length, while the Pompano dolphin fish body depth is greater than 25%. Both these species are commonly marketed by their Pacific name, Mahi Mahi. They are not at all related to dolphins. Dolphins are air-breathing mammals, whereas Mahi Mahi are water-breathing fish, distantly related to perch. In 2001, Corifina hipporus was included in the list of priority species of the General Fisheries Commission for the Mediterranean. The primary objective of the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture is to ensure the sustainability of fish species in the seas and to address the requirements in the fisheries sector by establishing required rules. This mainly includes the regulation of the activities concerning fisheries and aquaculture, monitoring and control of such assets and promoting the development of the aquaculture sector to apply products to the local and foreign market. The department also facilitates and ensures that consumers have access to fresh and healthy fish, gather, analyze and keep biological and economic information to serve as an objective basis for decisions underpinning the sustainability of fish in our waters. The department also serves parties involved as a means of education with the regulations imposed. Lampuki fishery is managed and regulated by the Fisheries Conservation and Control Division which issues Lampuki fishery licenses. The role of the fishing cooperative has changed throughout the years, as Paul Piscopo explains. The fishing cooperative was established in the 60s. In the 90s, a new cooperative was created which operated on a national basis. A cooperative is an autonomous association of persons united voluntarily to meet with their common economic, social and cultural needs and aspirations through a democratically controlled enterprise. In our case, the role of such cooperatives has increased and is now on a totally different level playing field. Currently, negotiations are taking place for the purchase of diesel for fishing vessels, quotas for bluefin tuna, and assisting in the drawing up of tender specifications related to fishing. Other roles include negotiations and discussions with the government and providing advice when necessary as regards to European Union matters related to fishing. The catch data held by the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture in Malta suggests that there have been significant fluctuations in the abundance of the Lampuka. Over these last years, a record number of Lampuki were landed in 2006, amounting to 559 tons. However, a downward trend 
has also been registered by the National Statistics Office in these last years. Dolphin fish catches have dropped by a staggering 60% over the past five years, official figures show, though opinion on what has caused this decline remains divided. A review of national fish catches conducted by the National Statistics Office shows that catches went down from 429,610 kilograms in 2010 to 172,827 kilograms in 2015. The drop was even more visible in Gozo, where catches fell as much as 80% over the same period. Opinions on the scarcity were a dime a dozen. Some mentioned the Italians' growing taste for lampuki, which was encouraging more of their fishermen to target the species. Others say that local fishermen had opted to trade fish on the open sea rather than through the Maltese market. Others felt that increased shipping movements along the Libyan and Tunisian coasts were drawing the fish away from the Maltese shores. Another opinion was that this scarcity is due to the number of dolphins and the bluefin tuna which feeds on the lampuka. However, others are of the opinion that the link between a reduced lampuki catch and increased shipping activity is a bit tenuous as the lampuki shortage could be an indication of changes in environmental variables, such as climate change, or could equally simply be a natural cycle one. All is not doom and gloom, as while rising sea temperatures are a concern for a number of species, they are less of a worry for the thermophilic species such as Lampuki, which actually prefer warmer waters. This is confirmed by this year's catch. According to the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture, in the first five days from the Feast of Santa Maria, where the Maltese waters faced a surge in temperature compared with previous years, some 800 to 1,000 boxes have been caught with more lampuki being caught in Gozo. The number of lampuki caught in these last 10 years has remained relatively constant, that is around 350 tons every year. One has to keep in mind that the cycle of the lampuka varies from year to year. Generally, one year of abundance may be followed by a shortage in the next year. Upon analyzing lampuki catching statistics, we notice that the size of the lampuka is decreasing every year. Whereas in 2011, the average size of the lampuka was 40 centimeters, the average size from 2012 onwards diminished to 30 centimeters, which is indeed a radical decrease. This is a clear sign of overfishing, which means that there is a lot more fishing taking place than the lampuka population can face. In the meantime, we have started discussing such an issue with other neighboring countries who are fishing for lampuki. In fact, we pooled our resources and worked collaboratively on an international project through the Food Agricultural Organization, known as FAO. Practically, we are discussing to take a stock assessment of this fish because it is indeed an important resource for Malta. This fish is practically different from other species as its growth rate is greater when compared with other species. Thus, statistical models used on other types of fish cannot be imposed on the lampuka. One needs to find the appropriate model for this kind of stock assessment. At the end of 2016, an international conference between Malta, Sicily, Tunisia and Spain led to the first stock assessment on the species. Initial reports show common patterns between these four countries, which means that the data being inserted in the model is coherent. From here on, more research work will be conducted to refine the model to produce more accurate results. 
We intend to continue working with these countries with the aim to gather more data and information which would lead to create knowledge and provide scientific advice and regulations. Such an effort between the countries concerned would ultimately provide us with a joint aim on the better preservation of this species. The Lampuki season may amount up to 40% of a Maltese fisherman's income for the year, with the fish being consumed locally and exported. The mere volume indicates that Lampuki have been an important source of food for the Maltese since centuries, which is probably why it has gained in popularity. The decrease in abundance of Lampuki migrating past the Maldives Islands could be attributable to the arrival in central Mediterranean waters of non-Mediterranean fishing fleets, which exploit a very large proportion of the migratory fish stock. On the other hand, the fluctuations in abundance could simply be attributable to a variation in the migration path from year to year, which, according to environmental parameters or otherwise, cause only apparent fluctuations in the abundance of the stock. Recent research conducted by Matthew Camilleri states that abundance fluctuations could also be associated with variations in the rate of natural mortality and growth, as well as recruitment, which is notably variable and unpredictable, and is normally the main process influencing changes in abundance. I started fishing some 20 years ago. When I started fishing, there were no modern technology to fish with, but there was definitely a huge abundance of fish. I remember days when we went out fishing for Lampuki and returning back home with our boats full. In recent years, countries nearby started fishing for the Lampuka as well, impeding us in catching the Lampuka in larger quantities. We have to go further out at sea to fish for the Lampuki nowadays. If too much Lampuki are caught, the price has to go down. It is a tough life. I have spent my entire life fishing and I have known better days. In 1758, in the 10th edition of Sistema Nature, Linnaeus derived the genus from the Greek word korife, meaning top or apex. The Lampuka is a pelagic oceanodromous species found in open waters but also near the coast. It forms schools and feeds on almost all forms of fish, epipelagic fishes, particularly flying fishes and zooplankton. It also takes crustaceans and squid. Lampuki are also attracted to sargassum, a floating brown algae that serves as both a hiding place and a source of food. Lines of sargassum can stretch for miles along the sea. The lampuka is a surface-dwelling ray-finned fish found in offshore temperate, tropical and subtropical waters worldwide. Spawning occurs in the open sea and is probably approximate to the coast when water temperature rises. From spawning experiments, it has been determined that the total egg production of an individual female dolphin fish has been estimated to vary from 240,000 to almost 3 million eggs per year for fish ranging from 500 to 1,100 millimeters, that is fork length, assuming three spawnings per year. Larvae hatch at approximately 4 millimeters total length and reach a length of 5.7 millimeters within four days. At 15 days, the larvae are approximately 15 millimeters long. Beardsley believes that the Lampuka can live up to a maximum of five years, although other researchers even state seven years, 
although they seldom exceed four. This is sustained by research conducted by Oxenford and Hunt in 1983 and Lesser in 2008, who eventually state that longevity is usually less than two years. According to Benetti, dolphinfish in captivity have not been sustained for more than 18 months. Catches average between 7 to 13 kilograms. They seldom exceed 15 kilograms. And Lampuki over 18 kilograms are exceptional. The general length registered is between 86 to 140 centimeters. According to the International Union for Conservation of Nature and Natural Resources, the maximum size is 200 cm, but more commonly is found to be 100 cm. However, a specimen of 153 cm in length and 34.5 kg in weight was once caught at Acapulco in September of 1957. The all tackle game fish record is of 39.46 kilograms with a length of 176.53 centimeters caught by Manuel Salazar. The method used in this record catch was trolling with soft plastic squid. It took him 34 minutes to land this fish at the Papagayo Gulf of Costa Rica in 1976. Lampuki have compressed bodies and a single long-based dorsal fin extending from the head almost to the tail. Their caudal fins and anal fins are sharply concave. They are distinguished by dazzling colors, golden on the sides and the bright blues and greens on the sides and back. Females are also usually smaller than males. The pectoral fins of the Lampuka are iridescent blue. The flank is broad and golden. Out of the water, the fish often change color, giving rise to the Spanish name Dorado, which means golden. It goes through several hues before finally fading to a, a muted yellow-gray upon death. The long and laterally flattened body is covered by a seemingly smooth skin, the extremely minute scales being embedded in the epidermis and hence not visible to the naked eye. On its flank, there is an undulating line which forms an inverted V-shape just above the pectoral fins. Along this line there are between 205 to 250 scales. The Lampuka is characterized by a prominent sexual dimorphism essentially shown in the shape of the head. This can be clearly observed in the mature male when it reaches a certain length on account of the growth of a kind of frontal crest shaping the anterior profile of the almost vertical snout. Females have a rounded head. The mouth is slightly awry and the jaw somewhat prominent. In both jawbones, one finds an external set of uncinate teeth pointing inwards and an internal set of heart-shaped teeth similar to those which are found on a nasal bone, small palates and tongue. It has only one very long and sufficiently high back fin with undifferentiated soft rays. The anal fin is well developed but is much smaller than the dorsal. The tail is markedly forked with two equal slender and pointed lobes which are slightly divergent. That lunate or forked tail propels this fast swimming fish to speeds of 40 miles or 64 kilometers an hour, although other research 
even quote speeds of 57 miles or 92 kilometers per hour. The scythe-shaped pectoral fins are not large, whilst the embedded ventrals are bent inwards. The back and dorsal fins have a greenish-blue or indigo-blue color. The latter is more or less dark with metallic reflections, while the sides are very bright due to the gold and silver sheet flecked by dark dots and golden patches. Lampuki are also known to follow ships, sometimes for long distances. Their fondness for ships led the ancients to believe that they would navigate a ship to its desired course. Little is known about the migratory and spawning habits of the Lampuka. Research is still being conducted on how this takes place. If one browses the internet, one can observe a number of photos of people with their prized catch of dolphin fish caught worldwide. The dolphin fish has been observed in the Atlantic Ocean. One may ask whether the Lampuka population found in the Mediterranean is the same as that found in the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, a scientific research was published last year whereby Malta also participated. This means that this study holds a sample of Lampuki caught around the Maltese islands. This study confirms that the population of the Lampuka found in the Mediterranean is different from that found in the Atlantic. What does this research offer us when it comes to managing this fish as a resource? This is being said because when it comes to managing such a resource, one needs to first establish where this resource resides. There are no boundaries for this fish, but the ambient at the bottom of the sea may create different groups within such areas. In order to take care of this fish, one needs to establish where such boundaries are and who is tapping such a resource so that a common guideline is generated between adjacent countries. This research has solved an enigma for us, as at least we now know with whom to discuss further as regards to other countries within the Mediterranean basin. This has definitely reduced the complexity of the issue when it comes to managing such a resource as the Lampuka, as it would have been more difficult if other countries outside the Mediterranean were involved. Other recent marine biology research projects dealt with aspects of the age and growth of the Lampuka. Such research was made possible by the Department of Biology of the University of Malta and which was presented during the annual biology symposium in 2012. The Lampuka is voracious and very swift when chasing its prey. It also has the peculiar habit of staying in the shade of wrecks or other drifting floating objects. Such floats also lure amberjack or Seriola dumerili, which tend to aggregate within the shadow cast by these floats. The lampuka is usually accompanied by other fish, such as the deep sea grouper, the triggerfish, amongst others, even if in other ways these have a completely different habitat. As soon as the season begins, those fishermen who are licensed to engage in this fishery lay out a number of anchored cork floats at intervals along a course running out from the coast into deep water. Each year, the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture receives a number of applications from full-time and part-time fishermen to lay Kanitsati floats. By drawing lots, each fisherman is allotted a site to lay floats on a bearing point, thus preventing disputes in the laying of these floats. Each licensee must lay at least 35 fish aggregating devices, or FADs, locally known as Kanitsati, in a straight line 
along the course indicated by the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture officials. Fishing sites are distributed all around the Maltese Islands except for what is known as the Swordfish Corridor, which is kept free from Lampuki fish aggregating devices so that swordfish fishing can take place. The sites to lay floats are generally Imja northeast and southwest, St. Paul's Bay, Valletta, Jlena, Marsa Scala, Marsa Schlock southwest and southeast, with Zuri as well as Schlendi and Marsalvorn being the main fishing port in Gozo. The Kanditsada consists of tubular masses of sheet cork, several layers thick, bound together with a polyethylene rope. Each float is marked together with a battery lamp to make it visible at night. The float is anchored to a heavy slab by means of a polyethylene rope. Just under sea level, palm fronds are tied to the rope to afford more shelter to the fish. In the early 1970s, a fisherman noticed that the Lampuki are attracted to feast on the algae and other growths that develop on palm leaves floating in the sea. Therefore, some fronds were attached to the float. The idea was so successful that henceforth the larger, lower fronds from palm trees came to be weaved into Kanitsati. Precisely why Lampuki do this is unknown. Some say that this serves the Lampuka to take shelter from the sun. Others claim it serves the Lampuka to hide from predators. Seeing this, the fishermen set out to create large floats that could shelter entire schools of fish. Lampuki tend to school beneath it, allowing for easy capture by fishermen using a net. The depth at which these floats are anchored varies from 100 to 800 meters, and it can be even deeper in some areas. In 1900, Janko mentions that the Spanish fishermen of Mallorca also knew of this method and called the gear La Muguera. The fish aggregating devices, or FADs, are very similar in shape for those used in the Mediterranean region. There are differences in the composition of the ballast and floats between those used in Sicily and in Malta. In Sicily, fish aggregating devices are constructed with a number of empty plastic bottles tied together to form a single float, which is tied in turn to two palm branches. The anchor line exits from this floating unit. At about 1.5 meters in depth, four more palm branches are tied to this anchor line about 1.5 meters apart from each other. The entire fish aggregating device is anchored to an anchor typically made of one or more large stones or anchor blocks. In the Pelagi Islands, the float consists of slabs of polystyrene placed in a jute sack. Four palm branches are tied to this float and the entirety, with no submerged palms, is anchored. Drifting fish aggregating devices are also occasionally used. The dolphin fish net is used to encircle fish aggregating devices. The net is composed of different sections with different lengths, depth and mesh size. The closer one gets to the middle of the net, the net becomes deeper and the mesh size smaller. The total length of the net varies between 180 to 300 meters, while in the purse, the net is up to 36 meters deep. 
The net is kept afloat by means of floats and is kept upright in the water by means of a lead rope at the bottom. This year, Lampuki fishermen felt the palm weevil pinch, a pest which in the last decade decimated more than 5,000 palm trees, may have a direct impact on the Lampuki season due to a shortage of palm fronds used for fishing this popular marine species. While for the time being the shortage is not yet alarming, if the situation gets worse, the only solution could be to revert to obsolete practices which were still used some 40 years ago. In those days, the netting used to be made of flat wooden pallets with bamboo sticks or old carpets. However, their weight poses a problem, as they are heavier than the palm fronds to lift. Instead of using the Kannitsata method with palm fronds, fishermen in other countries use canopies made from bamboo tied together. When we asked why such a method is not adopted amongst Maltese fishermen, we were informed by the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture that palm fronds have yielded much better results besides the fact that the palm frond is more resilient at sea. Once the Lampuki and Fumfri find afloat, they seek shelter underneath it for weeks or even months before they migrate again. The first comers actually find the shade under the palm fronds, the later ones sheltering in turn under those that arrived earlier. Gilbert Balsan, who was the principal fisheries protection officer at the Department of Fisheries and aquaculture explained to us how the sites are extended seawards opening in a fan-like manner. Fishing vessels less than 6 meters reach out till 25 miles from Maltese shores, with the larger vessels reaching further than that. The role of the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture is to provide appropriate bearings and positioning along the 7, 12, 25 and 100 miles routes. The sites start from 7 miles offshore and fish aggregating devices are laid at intervals of one half or three quarters of a mile depending on the district. The situation today has definitely improved over the last 30 years. Fishing vessels from 6 to 10 meters are equipped with a General Packet Radio System or GPRS. Fishing vessels from 10 meters and above are equipped with a Vessel Monitoring System or VMS. The General Packet Radio Service is a packet-oriented mobile data service on the 2G and 3G cellular communication systems global system for mobile communications. The most basic function of a VMS is to determine the vessel's location at a given time and periodically transmit this information to a fisheries monitoring center or FMC ashore. VMS units principally rely on global navigation satellite system, the GNSS, such as GPS for position and time information. The VMS transmits data to monitoring systems, generally using a variety of communication technologies, including terrestrial and satellite AIS and conventional satellite systems. Malta presently uses Iridium technology. Thus, the positioning of each vessel is established accurately, which helps to avoid any form of dispute between fishermen besides their general safety. The structure provides every licensed fisherman a compass bearing along which floats are laid 
so that each fisherman may have his own particular fishing area. This restriction as regards to fishable area is intended to reduce the fishing effort, thus controlling the sustainable yield of the stock. There are a number of designated ports to record all fish caught around the Maltese Islands. Besides the site of Marsa Shlokad in Marsa, other recording sites include St. Paul's Bay, Chilkewa, Marsalforn, and the new site in Schlendi. Gozo is scheduled to open shortly. The same procedure is adhered to at all designated ports to sustain appropriate monitoring and control for statistical purposes. The site at St. Paul's Bay has an adjacent weighing machine. A number of documents are generated electronically following appropriate input such as the landing sheet, whether this will be followed by direct sales by the fishermen or whether the catch will be transferred to the fish market in Marsa. Officials from the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture assist at these operational sites as all logging is done meticulously. Every year, the fishing boats are fixed up and freshly painted. They keep their own names, but they get a new wardrobe. Others start making the necessary preparations to equip their boats with supplies or any required maintenance. The already colorful boats are filled to the brim with hardly enough space left to maneuver. August the 10th, the most keenly awaited day for the Masterschlock fishermen and their families. Mass is celebrated in the open. This was followed by a short speech by the Parliamentary Secretary for Agriculture, Fisheries and Animal Rights, the Honorable Clint Camilleri, who briefly explained how assistance will be offered by the government to the fishermen in this important sector. It is the custom of these fishermen to gather in the port at the start of the Lampugi season to have their vessels blessed by the Marsashlok parish priest. Carvin was steered by the Skavone family as the small kayak wriggled steadily amongst the other boats. We were greeted by the fishermen who waved their palm fronds symbolizing when Christ entered Jerusalem. Dr. Fenek Faruja, who is the Director General at the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture, introduces the fishermen individually to the Honorable Clint Camilleri. We are greeted by smiles, cheerful faces and waving, unaware of what may lie ahead to the hardship that is to be encountered in the coming weeks. The Sea Star One is equipped and ready. In the coming days, we will be going with the Karabot family to fish for Lampuki. <laughs> the port was exceptionally busy with other fishermen carrying palm fronds and anchorage stones on their respective vessels. The crew of Cristore hired a small crane to assist in the lifting of the heavy anchorage stones. At least that would eliminate some of the hardship involved. But Michael Bojeya still has to move the anchorage stones around the deck of Cristure. Little do people realize the hardships involved when it comes to such preparations in catching Lampuki. The next day, a crew of Sea Star 1 were ready to cast off. Carmelo Carabot, known with his nickname as Takalci Talfonoc, waits for his three sons to return safely as they had already cast their anchorage stones 
on the designated bearing early morning. His sons, Jason, Chilio and Franz, are also known by their nickname as Taneno Takalchi. This is the first operation, that is the laying of the Kanetsati in Marsashlok southeast area along the set route given by the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture. The fishermen loaded their palm fronds, anchorage stones and cork floats. The task is not an easy one and is definitely back-breaking. Despite his age, Carmelo gives a helping hand. Franz told me that he does not allow his father to come with them because this particular task is quite demanding and laborious. But we noticed that he didn't inform us in front of his father. After all, Carmelo still seems to be directing operations on the ground like a retired general and instructing his sons what to do. It is the 14th of August, 4 p.m. Off we go in one of the most important operations of the Kanitsati fishing. The accurate positioning of these floats is made possible by means of good navigational equipment and by the superb seamanship of Franz Karabot, the skipper of Sea Star 1. Jason and Chilio Karabot list Lampuki fishing as one of their favorites because it provides a challenge as the fish are quite crafty when it comes to catching it. Mile after mile, Sea Star 1 lapped the waves. The sea had a devilish oscillating swell, but the Sea Star 1 crew are well experienced in such conditions, and even worse at times. The journey is long. Franz tells me that these ships, which moor here, serve as excellent Kanitsati floats and it is not the first time that they cast their nets to catch Lampuki seeking shelter under these ships. Jason and Chilio wait patiently for instructions from France. In the meantime, Jason takes the opportunity to check that everything is in order. Mistakes cannot be made at this stage. It is the moment of truth. France calls Jason and Chilio to get ready to lay the first anchorage stone. The brothers synchronize their work as they drop the anchorage stones, cork floats and palm fronds on the set bearing one by one. This job is at least done twice as the anchorage stones are quite heavy to travel with. This means more fuel costs. France tells me that one false move and we would not see tomorrow. That sent shivers down our spines, but we knew that we were in safe hands. The operation continues throughout the rest of the afternoon. Swift and experienced hands are essentially vital. Franz gives a lending hand to his brothers to quicken the pace as dusk is approaching fast now. The Sea Star 1 is now surrounded by blackness as we slowly return back to base. The light oozing out from the Sea Star 1 cabin is a relief. It is around midnight as we enter Massachlock port. Home is always a sign of relief as we are greeted with a warm yellow street light. We slowly disembark from Sea Star 1 and ended the day with a couple of stories from my side, much to the attention of the Karabot brothers. Now starts the moment of waiting and finding the right time to fish for Lampuki. Finally, after several attempts because of buoyant weather conditions and in finding a common date between all concerned, September the 5th, 3 a.m. becomes another day of adventure. Today is the moment of truth for the fishermen and our crew. 
France and Jason, together with their father Carmelo, make Seastar ready and equipped for the job that lies ahead. A fishing vessel that uses a net that draws together like a bag is referred to as a Persina. The Seastar 1 will temporarily serve as home, bed and kitchen for both the Karabot fishermen and our crew for the duration of this trip. Today the fishermen brought all the things they need from ice to keep the Lampuki caught fresh and the food they will need for the trip. One could feel the excitement all around, although this was surely not the first time that they had been out to catch Lampuki. Jason and his father Carmelo catch up with family matters. France has his attentive eyes fixed on the route of the Sea Star One. France has the face of a weathered, experienced fisherman and knows what it takes. The route is fixed and the GPS makes his life a little easier. A family photo reminds him of home. This trip will take Sea Star One to around 32 miles from Marseschlok into the Mediterranean where the Lampuka is probably most abundant. Jason loses no time to organize things. Carmelo gazes into the empty night blackness, recollecting some good old memories and most probably speculating on how many Lampuki they were going to catch. At times, the aged, attentive eyes of Carmelo monitor the work being done by his son Jason. He has taught his sons all there is to know about catching Lampuki. The journey is long and the throbbing engine of Sea Star 1 does not make life any easier. We are now surrounded by entire blackness as the Sea Star 1 rode a sea and sky of black in the very early morning hours. We felt literally like a float bobbing up and down along the slight swell of the waves. Franz signals his father that we are nearly there. As we approach the first Canizata, Carvelo switches on the portable searchlight. He is checking whether there are any Lampuki under the respective Canizati. At a distance we could not help but notice the distant ships with their lights on. At least, we were not alone. Our searchlight picked a sinister seagull resting on the cork float, which quickly fled away as soon as it sensed the light on it. The place becomes so eerie in pitch black conditions. No luck yet. It is break of dawn. As we close in on our Canizata, Jason uses the fishing fly to catch a Lampuka. This will indicate that they may be others under a Canizata. At this stage, the crew and fishermen are already one with the sea. When one is fishing for Lampuki and Fumfrey, the sea has to be as calm as much as possible. Carmelo is never disheartened. Experience has taught him that perseverance is the key. Carmelo takes a chance and tells Jason to cast the fishing net. Franz joins in to help his brother. The winch is used to haul in the quite heavy net. When the net is close to the starboard side, Carmelo joins in to assist. The catch is poor. Only three Lampuki are roped in. The hardship faced does not always translate into a fruitful catch. Carmelo and Jason arranged the dolphin fish net to cast on the next Canizata, if there are Lampuki. Carmelo directs his son Franz. Experience counts at this stage. Jason's face tells it all. He has his eye fixed on whether he can see the seabird known as the white-winged black tern. It is known that when the Lampuka chases small fish, the white-winged black tern would be close by to feed on this fish as it surfaces to free itself from its predator. A fisherman's life 
is not an easy one. The dark, tanned faces of the Karabot family reflect the enduring hardships they encounter after spending hours at sea exposed to all the elements. Early mornings, hard work, long hours and bad weather are enough valid reasons to keep them away from such work. It is their eagerness, drive and passion towards fishing that overcome all the hurdles that they might encounter. Jason prepares to use the fishing fly as the next anchored float is approached. He wears a glove to prevent skin irritation from the nylon, especially if he gets a good bite. Prior to the actual fishing operation, it is common practice to use feather lures or artificial bait. A decoy fish attracts other fish which may be present around the fish aggregating devices. It seems that we have Lampuki under one of the Kannitsati. The fishermen circle the Kannitsata at a 5 to 10 meter radius, trolling until a fish takes bait. They leave the decoy fish at the side of the boat to attract the other fish and then throw a mesh net over and around the school to capture them all. Jason throws in a plastic bottle to attract the other Lampuki. When the fish are aggregated in considerable numbers, they are caught by a surrounding net similar to a seine. It is the skill of such fishermen to cast a deep net around the mass without disturbing the Lampuki. This is one of the most crucial moments of the roundup. It demands great skill and intense focus. The next few minutes will make or break the catch. Speed is of the essence as the pressure mounts on. If they succeed, the catch may run into a number of Lampuki. The net is like a giant snare. The bottom ropes of the net were then hauled onto the vessel by means of a hydraulic winch, closing the net like pulling the drawstrings of a purse. When the ends of the net met, they were hauled on board the vessel so that the fish caught inside were concentrated in one small area of the net. The float is slipped between the bottom of the net, which is now closed, except for a narrow slit between the lead line. The net is closed. The Lampuki have nowhere to escape to. The last part of the dolphin fish net was hauled in by the three fishermen confining the fish in the landing container. When the fishermen cast their net, their bodies and emotions are stretched to the limit. This operation takes less than 10 minutes when such fishing is done by professionals. The procedure was repeated every time the presence of a considerable amount of fish under a float was detected by Jason, Franz and Carmelo. If the fishermen can find the school of Lampuki, they might have a chance of making good for the day. The fishermen told us that we had brought them a stroke of good luck, as they finally land a reasonable amount of Lampuki. We now register the first smiles of the fishermen as the Lampuki are placed in the landing container. Observing a number of Lampuki wriggling on each other is always a spectacular sight to watch. France pushes on to try their luck again. In the meantime, Jason loses no time to put the Lampuki in plastic boxes. There is a procedure to follow as the Lampuki must remain fresh. The Lampuki are covered with a plastic sheet and then ice is applied. In this manner, freshness is guaranteed as it is still early to return back to base. Carmelo gives a helping hand. The boxes of Lampuki are stored in the cold room below deck. We are approaching another Kanitsata. Franz steers slowly towards it. Jason prepares the fishing fly and lures to leave it at the side of the Sea Star 1 to attract the other Lampuki. There is a technique on how to 
hop without losing the fish. As the nylon is passed through the mouth of the fish, around the body and tied in fastening on the gills. Franz takes a look around using his binoculars. Jason is still using the fishing fly. Franz and Carmelo detect again a number of lampuki underneath the palm fronds. It's time for action again as Jason throws in the net one more time. And here we go again with the hope of catching another sizable amount of lampuki. Sea Star 1 circles the Kannetsata once again. The plastic bottle is thrown in and a hard working winch does its part again. It has been doing this for countless numbers of times. As the net is drawn near, the fishermen could see a number of glittering agile lampuki in the net. Carmelo drops in to assist in the last part of the procedure. Jason and Franz draw the net at fast speed to get the job done quickly. And all go in the landing plastic container for yet another round of success. Once again, the lampuki are placed in the plastic boxes and stored in the cold room below deck of Sea Star 1. This time the fishermen detected a number of pilot fish or fomfrey. They have a go at it as they cast their net again. The result was once again fruitful. As the fomfrey are placed in the landing container, Jason prepares the net again. It was time to return back home. The fishermen decided to return back to base as weather conditions were deteriorating. And thank God for that, as our crew could not take it anymore. The noise from the diesel engine coupled with the swaying to and fro of the Sea Star 1 literally wrecked the brains of our crew members. Slowly and serenely, Sea Star 1 re-entered Marsaschlok port at night. Franz expertly maneuvers amongst the boats until he moors Sea Star 1 along the quay. The day of the Karabot family is almost over, but there are a few pending tasks left that need to be addressed by the fishermen. Jason breaks the ice under the watchful eye of his father. The ice will be used to keep the Lampuki fresh until they are delivered to the final destination at the fish market in Marsa. In the meantime, Franz registers his Lampuki and Fumfrey catch with the Fisheries Protection Officer from the Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture. All details are logged and inputted in the landing sheet which incorporates the Lampuki sampling weight as well as other pertinent data such as the time the fishing took place, name and owner of the vessel besides other data. This serves for statistical purposes and for appropriate monitoring and control. In the meantime, Jason and Carmelo make the final preparations and wait for Franz to return. Franz reverses his pickup van along Sea Star 1. One by one, the boxes of Lampuki and Fomfrey were transferred from Sea Star 1 to their pickup van. Jason retrieves the boxes of fish from the cold room below deck. Carmelo tops up with ice and Franz transfers to the van. They have done this throughout their lives for a countless number of times. The Karabots work in absolute cabalistic silence. They know what has to be done without too much fuss. It is always a temptation for passers-by to take a look at what has been caught by the fishermen. At Marsaschlok, the process is complete. The fishermen drive home to rest for a few hours. They have to wake up early next morning to sell their Lampuki and Fomfrey at the fish market in Marsa.
It is September 6th, 3 a.m. The fishermen start congregating at the new fish market in Marsa. Whilst some are already at work, others grab a cup of coffee at Talmanik. This new fish market, which opened on the 30th of November 2015, replaces the 80-year-old fish market, or as locally known as the Pishkeria in Valletta. Equipped with the latest equipment, this fish market has an in-house ice-making machine to ensure freshness of the fish exhibited towards the consumer. The new facility has been constructed to the highest EU standards, guaranteeing greater efficiency and hygiene. This also meant that outdated practices which had been in place for decades have been replaced by an automated IT system. The new fishery facilitates better product traceability and offers a more efficient payment system for the fishermen. Around a thousand registered fishermen are making use of this new facility. The fishermen register their catch on a user-friendly computer terminal. The information is retrieved and is put on each respective box of fish. This information includes the name of the fishing vessel, the type of fish caught, the name and address of the registered fisherman who caught the fish and the weight of the fish caught. Jason and Franz transfer the boxes of Lampuki from the pickup van to one of the bays. Franz sticks the identification labels at the side of the box. The fish are then transported into the main hall of the fish market. Franz and Jason are amongst the first on site. Jason has a word with one of the buyers before the auction starts. Others observe one of the biggest lampuki caught on the day. This is a male lampuka caught by the Nostro Padre crew. Buyers, middlemen and fishermen start filling the main hall. The middlemen start their preparations for the day's auction. It is a time of anxious waiting. The hawkers roam around the auction hall eyeing what is a good buy. The role of the fish protection officers is to maintain fur trading and to make sure that laws and regulations are adhered to, most especially the hygiene factor. It is 4 a.m. sharp when the bell sounds. It is now that the auctioning of the Lampuki starts. Suddenly the air is filled by deep and loud voices as the hawkers definitely make themselves heard amongst the buyers. The fishermen watch closely and attentively. As soon as a deal is struck, the buyers take the Lampuki in their respective lorries and which can be sold immediately to the general public. This new system has indeed brought a change in mentality on how operations were conducted in the past amongst fishermen, the middlemen and the buyers. Franz and Jason wait patiently until it is their turn. Once called in action, boxes of Lampuki are weighed and a price is agreed upon by the parties concerned. Jason transports the now sold Lampuki caught by the Karabot family to the buyer. Another hard day's work for Sea Star One crew is over. Franz and Jason are happy to return back with their families. The activity continues throughout the early morning. Logging and monitoring tasks are essentially important as everyone keeps stock of this situation. We meet some happy faces after a good deal has been struck. The voices of the hawkers continue to dominate the air. Others argue on some seemingly important issue. Fish market officials and the police keep vigilant of the activity unfolding before their eyes as the activity draws to an end. The next day we met Hector. He had taken us to catch Lampuki some 27 years ago. He is among the few survivors of the F-15 fishing vessel, the Jacinta. 
We recall back some good old memories. We identify the crew through their nicknames, El Bomber, El Cincillo, El Bufflo, Giuseppe Talpupa, El Bluna, and El Baru. All are unsung heroes who braved the sea to raise their families through fishing and to catch lampuki amongst other fish. 16th of October 1991 will remain etched in our hearts forever. Indeed, an unforgettable experience as we recollect good old memories of that particular day. At night, all activities seem to stop and this quiet little village dozes off in accordance with the day's rhythm. The clock is reset. The Karabot family will set out again to catch Lampuki. Every struggle will be repeated. The solitude and deep waters faced. The empty nets, the aging machinery, the heartache of failure, and then the joy of success over and over again until Sea Star 1 heads for port again. Only a few can bear the hardships of a fisherman. A few like the crew of Sea Star 1. Tomorrow will not be another day. It will be the same, the same faces, the same difficulties, the same rhythmic waltz with the sea and the same will to catch Lampuki. Patiently, the fisherman untangles the net. Standing calmly, bracing the breeze on the dancing boat, cooled by the waters of the sea. The fishermen have to finish their work before dusk and then back home. The sun will soon set. Another day, another hopeful catch. The sea but remains the same. Daring to cast the fishing net in new waters, the fisherman moves closer to the life he believes that he was meant to live. There is just one life for each of us, our own.